thank you for having me. Um, you know, by uh, training, I am uh, a clinical psychologist and a statistician. And so when Dr. Sano asked me if I would speak here, I said, are you sure you got the right guy? Because uh, I'm not too sure about this. So what I've tried to do is to take what I, I know she knows that I do, because we are collaborators, uh, uh, um, and try to pitch it in a way that I think makes sense for uh, an AI audience. I apologize if I miss the mark at some points and talk to you about things you guys already know about. Just stare off into the distance or something, and I'll pick up on it. OK. Are these my sl is this slides? OK, great. So, um, <clears throat> so I want to start off. I, and, and what I'm really going to do is I'm going to talk about research that I've done and the mistakes that I've made in that research and how I think we need to move forward and what I think we can do better. And the first thing I want to show you is a, a prediction model, an estimator for treatment decisions. This was published by uh, the research team on which I'm a member in the New England Journal of Medicine in, in 2008. It became uh, uh, a site, and uh, an estimator site, uh, as you see on the right, that is maintained by the NICHD, where people could, clinicians and parents, could go and put in information about their extremely premature infants and come up with probabilities of disability or probabilities of death uh, at 18 months. And this was used uh, both nationally and internationally to, um, uh, for treatment making decisions. Uh, it's, uh, it's recently been updated. It's being used at about 637 member hospitals of uh, the Vermont Oxford Network across the United States. Um, and when I was working on this, my friends, the neonatologists, they were saying, hey, this is going to be big. This is going to be big. And I'm thinking, what, what could be big for a neonatologist, right? I, you know, maybe their, their parents get a copy of the article. But then CNN and Time, uh, Time, uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal started calling. And I mean, nobody, nobody wanted to talk to me, but which I'm not hurt or anything about. But um, uh, this was a big deal, and it continued to be a big deal. And I knew we would arrive. We had arrived when uh, apparently I don't watch TV much, but this uh, calculator showed up on the show ER where uh, it was being used to make a treatment decision. You know, personalizing a treatment decision, a young medical student pulled out their smartphone, started to type things in, and the wise old physician just patted him on the shoulder and said, we don't use that kind of thing here. So I knew I'd arrived, OK? And these are, these are some of the updates that have happened, some of the confirmatory modeling that's been done. Um, but could we have done better? All right. Now, the statistical model that we used, which it was nothing special. It wasn't, any, it wasn't even a complex system that we were trying to model. It was basically a multi-level logistic uh, model for pulling data across multiple sites. There was nothing in it. There was no support vector machine. There was no deep learning, nothing like that. We only had five variables. But we managed to improve prediction over and above what clinical recommendations were at the time. Still, could we have done better? And here's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about whether we could have done better at prediction, because we're pretty good at some of the prediction. All right? Instead, what I want to know is, could we have rigorously tested the degree to which the new prediction algorithm, perhaps packaged with some sort of treatment recommendation modules, um, might have conferred benefit or harm on patients, caregivers, and clinicians? Could we have done this in a way? Could we have, for instance, set this, instead of releasing this uh, into, the, into the wild, uh, as it were, could we have randomized participants such that clinicians received in, uh, information from these prediction systems uh, versus uh, uh, not receiving them to see if it improved the quality of the outcomes? So <clears throat> this ate at me for a while. and. Um, <sighs> As time moved on, uh, and, you know, I do a lot. I do a lot of different things, and I, I also have a, an appointment over at uh, MD Anderson in behavioral sciences. We do a lot of smoking cessation research. Um, we proposed, uh, and it's being uh, supported by uh, the the uh, the moonshot MD Anderson moonshot. What's called Project Pisces, which is a Bayesian smart design 
Um, the principal investigator uh, is Paul Sincerapini. And um, this was my attempt, my initial attempt at trying to answer the question, hey, if we develop prediction approaches, prediction algorithms for personalizing treatment, can we go about testing them efficiently so that we can argue that they either confer benefit or not, or that they confer harm? Because indeed, it is quite possible that a prediction model could confer harm. And, and my nightmare was, you know, suppose that, um, that we released that prediction model out into the, the general population um, uh, back in 2008, and then perhaps later on, we, we get, say we did a large survey, and we found out that um, all of the survival rates converged on what our model predicted. That would be scary, because what that might suggest is that people were making decisions from our model, right? Uh-oh, right? So much for progress. And so we need to it is my firm conviction that we need to test these things. So what this design was, it was a two-phase design, um, and uh, it's called Project Pisces. Uh, the first phase is what's called a Bayesian smart design. Um, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, at at 2,000 patients, uh, we stop uh, recruitment. We develop a prediction algorithm for the best, the best treatment pathway for a patient based on behavioral and genetic markers. Then we start the trial back up. And this time, we randomize people to either um, this prediction algorithm-based treatment or uh, the best uh, enhanced public health option for smoking cessation. OK? Um, and, and there are things that are, are better and worse. Now, Phase one, phase one is, it's going to look kind of scary. See, this is a smart design. Uh, what happens is you start out, maybe you randomize people to two of the best performing uh, uh, compounds, right? And then you either have responders or non-responders. Those who respond remain on the compound they started on. Those who did not respond are re-randomized. They're re-randomized to augmentation or to switching or to continuation. I mean, perhaps they just need to be on the medication longer. And we do this as a way of seeing if we can not improve uh, abstinence. Um, and <clears throat> when we get done with this, we mine this data to see if we can't predict or come up with predicted probabilities based on genetics and behavior um, uh, <clears throat> for who is going to succeed or who has the highest probability of succeeding in, in each different pathway, all right? Now, the reason that we did this in the first place was because nobody quit smoking once, all right? If you look at the literature, the literature basically estimates anywhere from most people who successfully quit, quit between 9 and 120 times. So, so real precise. Um, and, uh, and, and people's best guess is about 30, all right? So, and in most clinical trials, here's the problem. Um, all we do is we only care about the first quit. So if you sign up for a Pfizer trial and sh for Shantix, um, you are randomized, you have a quit day, you're, you're either on the drug or the placebo, and then once you smoke, you're done. We don't care what happens after that, you're a failure. But that's really not how it works, so what we wanted to do was propose various rescue modalities. What's the, pro you know, what's the probability that if somebody fails on one of these initial very promising modalities, they might, um, they might uh, benefit from some subsequent strategy? All right? And can we predict who those people are going to be ahead of time? Now, we'll come back to this here. So this is our, our design. Um, and. Uh, the way that uh, what motivates the prediction model here in the learning phase, the 2,000 patients, remember we'll see probably somewhere on the order of 750 in the, in the prospective uh, validation phase, um, is a study that we have recently completed that is also a Bayesian uh, smart design uh, called Project STAR. We actually are about to, to uh, submit this for publication. Um, and what we did with this is uh, our team 
ran a series of um, a series of machine learning models with um, this, we had about 404 participants. We broke them into two groups, five-fold cross-validation. The best-fitting model, the, the model that had the best uh, cross-validation metric was um, a support vector machine with a radial basis function. Uh, we have about uh, 10,000 or almost 11,000 predictors. And um, uh, you know, it's a small data set, right? But we were able to get pretty good out of or test data uh, prediction. Now the test data was pretty small. We ended up with two errors. So, I mean, obviously, squint real hard and just pretend that um, uh, that this is promising, but not definitive. All right. And what we wanted to do was provide a dashboard that would give uh, for each patient with each baseline set of covariates, genetic and behavioral and demographic covariates, all right, would give uh, what we might call um, uh, counterfactual predictions. Uh, in other words, if that person with those covariates went on one treatment versus another treatment versus another treatment, what's the probability that they would succeed? Um, what are the probability of this? Uh, NPSAE stands for uh, neuropsychiatric severe adverse events. All right, um, and the reason that that's up there is because for a while that was a real concern for Shantix. Um, what are the side effects? What are the costs? What are the most important predictors for that person? Here, in this particular case, we can see that, um, in fact, uh, major score five. <laughs> Uh, th now, this is a very old model, and no longer is the case. That's actually an, an ancestral DNA marker, all right? We know that there are biomarkers that exist that will define how well somebody uh, uh, responds to treatment. And uh, for instance, their met nicotine metabolic rate, which is genetically determined. Um, uh, we thought that people could use this then to make decisions, and that this was going to be sort of the motivating component that we built off of this 2000 right here. By the way, this entire trial is digital, all right? Everything is digital about it. From the pharmacotherapy, it's being delivered by telemedicine, to testing whether or not people are smoking, which is being done. Uh, there are these little things you can plug into your smartphones and blow into them, all right? You know, and I guess I can take a picture of you so I can't have my kid blow into it, you know, or, or for that matter, put my Apple Watch, like my Apple Watch is at home on my fan right now. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, um, so, uh, so basically, um, uh, <clears throat> everything here is digital. We have approximately 500 people enrolled in this study thus far in, in phase one, and we plan to go to 2000. Okay. But, you know, when we designed these trials, I wasn't really too happy about doing them, all right? So I'm, I'm a young guy, I, you know, I climb in the ranks, climb in the ladder, and I said to one of my, one of my older colleagues who wanted to do these smart designs where we randomize and re-randomize, I, I really don't think that these are the, the most efficient designs. And he looked at me and he said, Chuck, I just want to do one of these. And I was like, Okay, well, we'll do the best one we can. And, and, and by the way, I'm often wrong, and <clears throat> we've gotten a lot out of this. But I think that there's a better way, a more efficient way <clears throat> of doing these trials. Um, and that is to use adaptive trial design, which is defined as any clinical study that uses accumulating data to decide how to modify aspects of the studies it continues without undermining the validity and integrity of the trial. Okay. Um, the adaptations focus on specifications where we still have uncertainty. Um, and uh, those adaptations are based on pre-specified rules, okay? And if you guys want these slides, you, know, you can have them, right? Uh, so on pre-specified rules. Um, and uh, this permits a, a specification of a target for the design to optimize. Now, there are a lot of different types of these designs that have been developed. As, as some of the greatest developments have taken place over at MD Anderson. Uh, I, should, I should call out uh, Don Barry, Peter Thal, and Jack Lee. 
All right, I don't know if you're here, Jack. When I was a kid, Davy Crockett was my hero. You're now my hero. I know that's kind of weird, but you know, um, I really would love to work with you. Okay, there are different kinds of trials. Seamless phase two and three trials. Enrichment trials, where we actually begin to focus and enrich the sample that we're working with as we see that certain subgroups are responding differentially. Continual reassessment methods. We use this when we uh, want to sort of target uh, a dose uh, toxicity relationship. All right. Um, and these last, this and the next one, uh, are the ones that we're going to focus on here because I think that they're the most salient for us. The first is this response adaptive randomization, such as a play the winner design or a drop the loser design. All right. You know, any of you who have kids who are dating are familiar with Drop the Loser, I hope. <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> I, I don't really want to say it, you know, but OK. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> sort of a, a, a larger set of platform trials that may incorporate these features. What I hope we can do is just very briefly cover the underlying mechanisms that allow these trials to work, OK? Now, when we are dealing with adaptive randomization, which is also used in uh, platform trials, we're really attempting to solve a reinforcement learning problem where we're balancing exploration versus exploitation. OK, here's where some of you are going to fall asleep. OK, so um, <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to investigate the possibility and promise of new in interventions, but we also want to try to capitalize on what we know really works. All right? Um, such that we get to an unbiased and decisive conclusion based on a probabilistic estimate for, uh, uh, for various treatment effects. And um, what happens as we do this is that patients who come to the trial as the trial continues are subsequently allocated to the most promising interventions. All right. So again, those of you who are know all about this stuff, these AI folks. Um, this is the classic paradigm. Uh, yeah, the, take a nap uh, for reinforcement learning that I like to think about as the bandit concept, OK? Imagine you walk into a casino, OK? You got four slot machines, each with its own unknown probability of success, all right? But you don't know what those probabilities are. And you got a handful of quarters. I guess it's quarters. I'm a statistician. I don't gamble, so I don't know. Um, and um, you go into these slot machines. So what do you do? You know, let's assume that you have different probabilities of payoff, and some might be better than others. We, I don't know how this works. But so you might go and you might play a certain number of coins in each one of these, just randomly, right? And you do that, okay? Some you get, you win more than you lose. Some, well, you always lose more than you win, but in some, you might win more, all right? And what you can do is take these outcome values. You can estimate the probability of observing a success on each coin insert, and then calculate, the, take that probability of success, and normalize it so that, uh, that they all sum to 1. And then you can begin to randomize uh, the receipt of coins or the de deposit of coins into these slot machines based on those normalized probabilities, which you can update every time you observe an outcome. All right? And this is how you do a Bayesian adaptive randomization design, OK, um, where in this case the quarters or whatever they are, are your, uh, they are your participants, OK? And your bandits are your treatments or your prediction algorithms. Now, how do, we, how do we go about doing this updating? Well, my particular, um, my particular bias is in favor of using Bayesian approaches. I like the sequential updating nature of Bayesian approaches where we take a prior, we add the data to it, and we update that into a posterior. We continually do that. Each one of these posteriors, after we deposit a coin, becomes our new prior. Right for each one of these, uh, each one of these slot machines, um, I personally will say. <clears throat> now I'm going to speak as a clinical psychologist. You can do a frequentist 
adaptive trial, but if you do, it is diagnostic that you are a masochist. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this was one of our first trials. Uh, I got, I got kind of busy, and so I just started having anybody who I would do the analysis just write it. Um, and uh, this is one of my one of my uh, my students and postdocs who's now on the faculty. I'm very proud of. So I shouldn't I shouldn't say that. He did a great job writing this up. This is a drop delusion design for cocaine um, uh, use uh, disorder, where we started out with uh, two. Um, two doses of an active treatment and a placebo. We did an interim analysis. We used pre-specified rules for dropping one of them, and we continued on. Here's another one, OK? Um, this is uh, a Bayesian adaptive des uh, randomization design that we conducted at the VA for determining what dose of ketamine we might want to try for geriatric depression. All right, And this was actually, we did this in just the same way that um, that I described the multi-arm bandit proposal. Uh, we did a one to three randomization, uh, and then 25% uh, uh, of patients went into a control condition, because I thought that the algorithm would bring that condition to an end very rapidly. Okay. Um, then the adaptive randomization included both the uh, control condition, midazolam is the control condition, and the three doses of ketamine. And um, we were able to, uh, to narrow this down, and I forget how many patients we did this in, but uh, it was somewhere on the order of like 48 patients or 50 patients. Um, and uh, we were able to identify the best dose, uh, which was uh, 0.5 milligrams per, per kilogram of ketamine. So how can we use this approach? in testing AI prediction models and interventions in the context of a learning healthcare system. And I'm going to back up for just a moment because the, uh, many of the institutions here in the medical center are part of a, a, a CTSA, NIH-funded CTSA, where the focus is on uh, learning healthcare systems. And the fundamental idea is, I mean, that big trial I showed you where we have 2,000 and we've got uh, another 750 people, um, if it weren't for internal resources at MD Anderson, uh, that thing would take forever to get done, all right? Um, what we really are hoping that we can do is we can take uh, everyday clinical practice, collect the most compelling questions that both clinicians and patients have, decide on which ones we want to focus on, and then overlay the trial onto the clinical practice. I'll give you an example. I do a lot of work in pain remediation. Oh, am I, am I out of time? All right, yeah, pain remediation, OK. So it turns out that um, cannabinoids actually are very good at treating pain. It is the case that uh, in, um, in trauma surgery, we currently treat pain um, using both opioids and some trauma surgeons are now prescribing dravidiol, okay, which is THC, uh, for pain as well, thinking that this may lead to less opioid exposure and less subsequent uh, habit formation. All right, but it hasn't been tested. We could eat. It, we, in other words, there's some level of equipoise here because some people are doing it, some people aren't. Why couldn't we randomize? in some way. Why couldn't we superimpose things? So um, this platform trial is just a way to superimpose sort of an ongoing um, sort of uh, <clears throat> approach to in which we graduate arms using that Bayesian adaptive response adaptive randomization approach. Maybe we start out with, th with three arms, including standard care. And then some arms are graduated for uh, efficacy. Some arms are graduated for futility or harm, all right? And uh, we, can, uh, we can actually then shunt new arms in to, in, in, into where those lo are located. And I haven't done one of these yet. I'm going to tell you right now. I really want to, though, all right? Anyone, anyone interested, let me know. Okay. Um, and uh, 
In fact, there, there is some, some pretty nice software located here uh, at the MD Anderson webpage that allows you to simulate these trials. This is a simulated trial with five conditions where you start out with three. And each one of those points, um, the solid, first of all, the solid points represent um, uh, successes um, and the, uh, the, the, the non-fill points represent failures. And you can see that um, we start out with, uh, th with a certain number of active treatments. We gradually are able to come to conclusions about some of them, discontinue or graduate them for whatever reason, and then begin to move other uh, treatments into that pipeline. And I think that this might give us a way to begin to test these things. So uh, this is, these are the, apps, the actual accrual numbers. Normally, we might run 10,000 of these simulations to decide uh, exactly what our rules might want to might want to do, and so this is my last slide because I know I'm probably over. So, what's one possible way forward is to adopt an, a learning healthcare system approach in which we overlay adaptive randomization or platform trial designs onto clinical practice. When it comes to these predictive algorithms, like the one I showed you at the very beginning, we can begin to slot in iteratively refined new algorithms, okay, in randomized fashion so we can actively test these things online, make some decisions as quickly as possible. Because remember, this is science. The object is not to succeed. The object is to fail fast, all right? And we can move on and go with the very best options so that we can confer as much benefit as possible um, uh, for patients, caregivers, and, and, and clinicians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the floor? Yeah, just shout. <laughs> success with FDA to accept this kind of trial design? Because mm -hmm. they usually are frequency and they want to have that dichotomized mm -hmm. uh, randomization. Okay, that's a great question. So uh, during um, COVID, I was involved with a, a, a trial that we are just, that's under review at JAMA right now uh, that had to do with COVID. Um, and that was a Bayesian adaptive design, and the design was accepted by the FDA, all right? Although I will tell you it was a phase two trial, all right? So it wasn't for the final indication. Um, uh, let's see here. I have had, uh, so we, are, we don't have any problem getting INDs or IDEs, as the, as the case may be. Um, uh, and I do think that there have been some approvals based on, on, on Bayesian uh, models. I can tell you almost everything I do is externally funded, and uh, both the adaptive designs and the Bayesian statistical approaches have been broadly accepted. The FDA actually has statements out about these. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the Myro's most recent reading of adaptive of the adaptive designs that the FDA put out was written by somebody who didn't, I think, know what Bayesian statistics were. Um, and again, that particular masochist, don't let them lead you down the primrose path. Sure, other Can I just add one more question? So adaptive trial design, of course, is designed for the clinical trial, which is accumulation of data prospectively. Sure. So you can decide which group to eliminate, which group to add. So have you, or Richard Berry, have you guys thought about using this adaptive design and Bayesian statistic to looking at retrospective data? For example, I, walk, I had walked in the clinic as with shortness of breath, mm -hmm. but my shortness of breath may be more important if I have COPD versus I don't have mm -hmm. COPD. Mm -hmm. So that means, but I have been thinking about how this adaptive and Bayesian design mm -hmm. or statistics can be applied to going retrospectively because then AI would be very helpful to actually look at different variables and f find out which one will help me to be more serious about shortness of breath. Yeah, I, I think that, um, of course, there are some inherent uh, difficulties in, in looking at the retrospective data. Randomization is balancing for uh, covariates, both measured and unmeasured, as opposed to 
really using the, the best causal analyses that we can that balance for measured variables. Um, and so I'm always highly skeptical of retrospective data. However, where I use it, uh, uh, for instance, the, that very first algorithm that uh, I showed you, that was based on retrospective data. Yeah, yeah. So it can be used, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, let's take one more question, uh, Ankit. Um, so there's a lot of focus these days on, on health. So, so many patients want to uh, minimize the amount of medication they're taking for various reasons. Just it might be just a general bias, like hey, less all else equal, less medicine better, or minimize side effects. Mm -hmm. um, so, is it you know are people running these kinds of adaptive trials to figure out what the right right dose is for each individual? Right, you start with a very low dose and then double until it starts to create an effect yeah. for that patient. Is that happening or? So that's a great question. Um, one of the ways that we're doing that is to pursue uh, what are called. An, a, I know this sounds like an oxymoron, but um, randomized N of one controlled trials, all right? We've published a couple of these uh, from my center um, where you're really randomizing the order of administration within a particular individual and you're cycling through those. You're dropping the ones that either have uh, un uh, intolerable side effects or uh, the ones that are not performing well and you're going through several iterations the next step in doing this is, A, to show that this does better in a clinical setting, okay, if we can apply it in a clinical setting, and to use this Bayesian updating approach because as we accrue data on people, we may not have to take people through as many cycles of these drugs, okay? We may be able to predict better, you know, how, how, they'll, how they'll do. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Green.